Hi, I'm Jim W6LG, your YouTube Elmer. Welcome to my radio room here in Rockland, California. Few tubes have been as iconic and a bigger part of ham radio as this tube. This is the iMac version of the original 3-500Z. Tube with 500 watts of plate dissipation, and we'll look at that in just a minute. Um, it's designed to take a beating and keep on working. Um, average plate voltage, probably 32, 3300 volts. Uh, chimney goes around the tube like this and uh, blows air up and around the glass envelope of the tube. Now, some of the chimneys I have I like better because this part of the glass is, is curved inward to force air towards the plate cap, the metal cap on the top of the tube. There's another tube that's a newer version. They're made in China, but so far they've been pretty reliable if they work initially. And that is this tube. This is a 3-500Z. I can't get the lights off of there because they're next to the uh, camera. But you can see the fins on the plate structure and uh, the folks that designed this felt like it would handle greater power than the original design, plus the plate is graphic, graphite. So there's the original design and the lights, I can't uh, make them go away, either tilt, maybe tilting a bit. So it's finned vertically. This is ribbed horizontally. The sockets are the same, pins are the same. Um, a really great tube. Now, one of the problems with this kind of tube is if there's not enough air blowing across the socket and the bottom of the tube, then what can happen is the solder can run out from around those pins on the filament and it will go open. And so sometimes if the filament goes dark and you think, oh crap, the tube has died, you can take it out, put some solder into it. If you can find some high temperature solder, even better. Another classic tube that I don't have, but would be the next choice down in the, uh, in the scheme of things, 500 watts of plate dissipation would be the 572B slash T160L. The 572B is a great rugged tube, again, a graphite plate with 160 watts of plate dissipation. We'll get into what that means. So two of them would be 320. And um, it came out in the late 1960s as a replacement for the next tube down the list, an 811A. We're going to look at the price of 811A's 5, um, 572B and the 3-500ZG, um, probably on the Penta website and maybe DX Engineering and maybe uh, Ameritron as we're going through the list. The 11A, tube has been out forever, was originally designed in the late 1920s, so it's darn near 100 years old. And it was an, um, originally a modulator tube in the 19. 50s and 60s, it became popular in linear amplifiers. There are all kinds of linear amplifiers with 811As, as there is today a couple from Ameritron with either three tubes or four tubes. The 572B came out, and for those of us running 811As at the time, we looked at that tube and thought, oh, it'll increase our output. It really didn't, but it gave us some headroom in the tubes. The 3500Z, when that came out, it was really groundbreaking. A lot of companies came out with linear amplifiers like Heath and Drake um, and um, uh, Kenwood. The configuration was usually two tubes, anywhere from 2500 volts to 32-3300 volts. The Drake L4B, the original model um, the, of the L4B, was 2500 volts, zero bias which really doesn't mean much. But at the time you could run, you were allowed to run 2000 watts input 
The output didn't matter, but it fell in the category of 1200, 1300 watts. As amplifiers are roughly 60 to 65% efficient. Keep that number in mind. So the uh, 3500Z came out. It was relatively inexpensive. I think it was about 70 bucks a tube. You could buy an amp, uh, I think for the SP220, I think was less than $400. Build that thing, put it on the desk, and run uh, the 2,000 watts input until the rules changed. And then you probably could run 1,500 watts output with it because the tubes are capable of that. Let's go to, because uh, there's some issues here with the current output rating on some amplifiers. But to decide that, let's go look and see what the manufacturer or the importer says is what the tube can handle. And let's go there now. Okay, so here's Penta Laboratory, says so since 1951, so they ought to know what they're doing. Uh, let's see if we can find some tubes here. And as you can see, they've got quite a selection of tubes. Let's look at... Um, the 3-500ZG and it is um, if you buy directly from them it's $270 and it's a Hymu triode plate dissipation of 500 watts and let's scroll down the page and we're going to do a little bit of math but not much um, Okay, so let's let's look at this. Here's the typical operation, cathode-driven RF linear amplifier. Um, play voltage, 3,500. Um, single total current, 400 milliamps. We know that's the max. Uh, input power then would be 1,400 watts. So plate current times plate voltage equals the input power. Here is the output power of 890 watts. The, roughly the difference between 1400 and 900 is roughly 500 watts. So that tube is being run at its max. So the plate dissipation is the difference between these, these two numbers. Two tubes combined, 1800 watts. So that gives a little bit of headroom at 1500 watts. Now keep that in mind. Plate current times plate voltage equals the plate input power. They're gonna give us the output power. Let's see what that works out to, just out of curiosity. They're saying uh, 1400 watts, I've got 890. I'm doing this with a calculator. Divided by 1400 gives us an efficiency of 0.635. So that's an honest number. 63% is achievable with a ground and grid linear amplifier. Okay, so let's slide that off, and here's the DX Engineering website. And let's see if we can find our way to the linear amplifiers and take a look and see. Okay, so here's a um, single 3- uh, sorry, uh, 8877. It's a 1500-watt plate dissipation tube. Says uh, 2500 watts out, and that's easily done. Um, says 7,000 bucks. Seven grand. 6,000 buys you, I guess, um, not sure what the difference is. Uh, oh, imported, import. Oh, the tube is imported instead of an iMac. Okay. Uh, here's a 3CX1200. Uh, so that's 1200 watts of plate dissipation, slightly bigger than two 3500Zs. 6,000 bucks uh, claimed output in excess of 2,500 watts. That's probably reasonable doing the math in my head real quick. Um, two 3CX800s, which will give you easily 1,500 watts out, $5,300 out of stock. You have two of these left, which is a 3CX800 one tube. So that'll get you about 1,200 watts output, uh, 4,200 bucks. I've got two of those out of stock, out of stock. Um, not in stock. Uh, 
572B, four tubes. Now, the manufacturer said maximum output was um, I think 300 watts was the number. So this says, I think it was 320. This says about that for 2,900 bucks. Here is one 3500Z. Manufacturer said about a kilowatt out. That's what it is, 2,700 bucks. By the way, not in stock. The one before that, not in stock. Um, one 3500Z. Now that's becoming, uh, let's just stop here just real quick. Um, uh, yada, yada, yada. The, so this is becoming a more reasonable price tag. So here's a, okay, so this is a kilowatt out. And so you're at about $2.70 per watt out. Now they're getting down into the neighborhood where some folks may be able to afford an amp. Here's another one tuber, um, 2500, 4572Bs. That's probably pushing their limit. That's 2400. AL80B, 2400. So, as a choice, I'd like you to consider this amplifier, which is a good looking amp. It's the Drake L4B. This one's from the 1980s. They date back to the 1960s. Some of them are pretty beat up. They've been modified. Um, this one has not. And I'll go over the parts and pieces that are in it in the next video. Um, but this is one that I'm cleaning up and going to put on the air. This one is capable with 100 watts of drive of about 1,200 watts output, maybe 1,300. And... Um, the parts on the inside are very heavy duty compared to what's available today in a new amplifier. Um, it has gear reduction on tuning the plate and uh, tune, uh, plate and load capacitors. Blower is built into the chassis, blows air into the pressurized chassis up around the tubes. So we talked about the chimneys are curved. Um, those red things are resistors. The tank coil is gigantic. As you can see, it's quarter inch copper tubing that's been silver plated. The band switch is good, which can be a problem. If the band switch is broken, uh, it'd be one of those things where I would not buy it because the, the repair would be just pretty hard to do. Um, in the next video, I'll go over the parts and pieces that make up this amplifier. But again, it's a good looking amp. Um, if it's been well maintained, maybe a one one owner, and if you can get it for a thousand dollars, you'll get uh, a good amplifier. And there, I'm zooming in on one of the contacts that looks a little dirty uh, on one of the switch positions. All right, there you go. A look at um, linear amplifier tubes, plate dissipation, how the cal calculation is made, um, and some of the amplifiers that are available from. Uh, quality retailers like DX Engineering. Thanks for watching. I'm Jim, W6LG. See you the next time. If you haven't subscribed, uh, please do that. Give me a thumbs up if you can. Thank you. Bye-bye.